Welcome to another edition of the GM Files. Jim Duquette alongside Bobby Evans. Today, we are glad and happy to be joined by former general manager of the New York Mets, Omar Minaya. Omar, great to see you. As always, we, you and I talk all the time, so we have all these all these questions. I said, I'm going off script. I know him so well. So that's, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get right into it because uh, I, I wanted to ask you this right out of the gate because I remember when we'd go to lunch, we were working together, we'd go to Shea Stadium every day. We'd go to lunch nearby in Corona and we would go by, you know, uh, you know, the area where you grew up. And I always struck yeah. me at the time, like, all right, here's a guy who grew up in the, almost the shadows of Shea Stadium. Then you end up becoming the general manager you know, for people who don't know that story, I mean, just how how cool is that for for you to? And I don't know, was that ever a goal of yours when you were growing up playing baseball? No, it wasn't a goal of mine. You know, I mean, a goal of mine was to be a center fielder in the major leagues. And you know, growing up in the era of the center of the great center fielders of Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, um, and those guys, uh, you know, I just you know, I wanted to be a center fielder. I wanted to to be a, a major league baseball player. At that time, of course, I would not even know or think about what a general manager is. A little different now because now you got young kids that I tell you, they don't want to be players. They want to be general managers. I'm like, what about being a player, you know? Uh, but first of all, no, I did not. And it was a, you know, it was a great experience for me. Um, uh, first, you know, uh, unexpected, unexpected as you know, I, I, I started my career with the Texas Rangers. You know, I played professional with the Seattle Mariners. And then started uh, my scouting, uh, quote unquote, executive career with the Texas Rangers. And, you know, when I got a call uh, from Steve Phillip at the time to be his assistant, at that time I was Doug Melvin's assistant from Texas, you know, it was like, really? I said, I never thought of uh, the idea to be able to come to be to work, like you said, right in the shadow of Shea Stadium. So, you know, uh, Bobby, Jim, you know, first, it's great to be here with you guys, but uh, it was a great experience. It was being a great part of, for me to be part of the Mets family. Uh, as a kid that grew up going to the games and knowing everybody there, you know, knowing, you know, and I know J Jim names that maybe Bobby does not know, but when you talk about Jimmy Plummer, when you talk about Bob Mann, these are people behind the scene that work in the stadium that as a kid I knew and to then to go there and be the general manager, you know, the, the Pete Flynn, the ground school guys, I knew these guys when I was a kid and to be the general manager, uh, so it, was a, it was a, it's, you know, it was a blessing for me to, you know, to be part of the organization those years and to be part of that city and the fabric and everything that goes with it. It was a, it was a dream come true. You know, and Omar, you have a reputation in the game of being, you know, one of the, one of the great gentlemen, of the game. Um, and I, I remember, uh, you know, just as I was getting to know you, I, I got a, a taste of that firsthand that you were sitting, I think at a, probably an all-star game or, or maybe a postseason game. And my mom and dad were positioned like right in front of you or right behind you. And, uh, and I, and I, I heard afterwards all the great Omar stories of how kind you were and warm and friendly yet you're in this high elevated position. And yet, you know, you're very personable and down to earth and, you know, as a as a up and coming you know executive at the time, I had great role models around me, you know, and Brian Sabian and Jack Hyatt and Dick Tidrow. But it was great to see that from from someone um, on another team, and 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 I've always admired that about you. And and yet here you are, you know, years ago, the first Hispanic to hold the GM title. I mean, what what did that mean to you at the time, and 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 uh, how impactful? And how do you look at the game today in terms of our diversity? Well, uh, you know, you, you're right. And I do remember, uh, I, 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 I vaguely, and I say vaguely remember your parents, you know. <laughs> I know your history, if I, if I believe it's a North Carolinian, am I correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. So I know there was something there, and I don't remember. I do remember vaguely, and I remember, you know, when you, you know, came in the scene and all that other stuff. And I might have been because of good people, good, some real good North Carolinians that I knew over the years like Johnny Oates and others, you know, good That's people, right. you know, and uh, there's something, but I, you know, uh, you know, here I am, you know, ended up being, you know, first a general manager with the um, assistant general manager with the Mets for many years and worked with Jim together um, in the Mets. And then uh, I was able, I was very fortunate that the commissioner Seely uh, called me and said, Hey, look, you know, I, I was an assistant with the Mets. I had a pretty good, you know, uh, it was Jim would know, you know, we worked there, but you know, with the Wilpon family, it was, there was a, it was a very great family to work for. And for me to be a New Yorker, to be an assistant, 
But to be the opportunity to go to Montreal and be the first Hispanic general manager, um, it was, I, I had to say yes. And I say yes, it wasn't. A lot of people say, you really want to do this because remember at the time, there was going to be contraction, you know? So right. this was only going to be for one year. So it was taking a major risk. And, the, you know, look, the story about how that happened was, you know, I got the job and I get a call from Sandy Alderson and tells me that I got like six employees in the whole organization, the whole organization. I get a fax. In those days, we were getting fax, remember? Not yeah. email, a fax. And I look at the fax and I say, okay, there's only six employees. Because part of the lawyer, when the lawyer bought the team, he took all his, empl all his employees with him. And I believe this is on Monday. And on Saturday morning, we were, it was all um, pitchers and catchers. Not only they reported on Friday or Thursday, but pitchers and catchers were going to be outdoors. First day of camp. And I had to fill up the hold, but you know, as a, being given that opportunity to be the first Hispanic to open doors, hopefully for others, and and I think all of us, I think we've all been through that cycle where we interview for jobs. Well, I went through that cycle for a little while. Jim lived it with me for many times. You know, we're talking about eight to ten interviews where you always, you know, you were you heard it. Hey, you know, it was you or the other guy and. You know, you said, and when you walked out of that interview, you felt like, oh, man, I got this job. I really got this job. <laughs> and it didn't work out. But, yeah, it, being the first Hispanic uh, meant a lot. Uh, not, so I think a lot of people, it might have meant, it means more to other people, I kind of found, than it meant to me. I mean, it was just great that I had a chance to be a general manager. But there's so many other people that later like, will come up to you and say, hey, you know, I just, you know, actually the guy from, uh, what's the name, it's the president, uh, 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 the president uh, from the Minnesota Timberwolf, uh, Wolf, mm. is, is Columbia, yeah. okay? And he right. told me, and he was, we were just, the thing, his, his inspiration to be a general manager in basketball was when I got the job with, with Toronto. I, like, I thought, wow, really? You, you, know, you got to be kidding me, you know? That's but that, cool. that's how that worked. That's, That's pretty cool. All right, I mean, so you come back to the Mets, and so we were involved, and in, and in you ended up convincing. At that time, Pedro Martinez was one of the best pitchers still in the sport. He was coming off of Boston, coming over to 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 sign with the Mets was a big deal. Uh, you were able to convince him to do that. Obviously, uh, a little bit after that, Carlos Beltran. But take us through, if you would, behind the scenes. The, the two different times, one of them I believe was over Thanksgiving period of time when you went down and broke bread with him to get him and convince him not only of, the, of your vision, but the vision to leave and come to New York. Well, you were part of that too, Jim, so I remember. You know, you were, you were part of that. Uh, you know, it was just a situation where we come into New York and I say we because, you know, we had a group of staff. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Boston Red Sox just win the World Series. Um, you know, there's rumblings that Pedro is uh, not happy there. You know, there's rumblings that he's looking for a three-year contract, a four-year contract, and that they were not, you know, uh, they were not going to give it to him. You know, it just – so I, I originally never thought about it. You know, I thought I was putting a team together, kind of put a plan in place. You know, um, I remember, Jim, we were kind of just discussing – Let's put a strategy in place. You guys been there where, okay, you come into an organization, you got to put a plan in place. You know, it's going to, it can be year to year, even though, you know, in New York and big market, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, LA, you know, it's those five year plans do not, they don't, you know, it's not going to fly there. You know, so you may, you might try to get away with a year, but in the end, what really happened was, you know, uh, the agent, uh, Fernando Cusa um, and I, we had a good relationship, you know, um, and I, uh, we kind of heard through the grapevine that, you know, that Pedro was not, you know, feeling it. They were looking to give him two years, you know, and, you know, and then in, what happened was somewhere along the line, either myself or I think us as a group said, look, let's put a plan in place. The one thing that was big for us, and I don't know if you remember, Jim, it was that the network was going to come to place in 2006. When I say the network, SNY. And my sell okay. to the Mets and to the ownership was, if the network is coming in 2006, why don't we invest this year, okay, 
let's invest this year so when we get to the network uh, open up, we have a, a base. Now, we didn't know we had just finished, I think, you know, really, not, not in a good year, last place or next to no, last place. Really. Yeah. And, you know, no, the team was older. You know, we had some good pieces, but there was a lot of, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't gelling. And my thought process was, look, we got to go make a statement. We got to go get a guy because you guys have been there. You need a guy to bring other people on board. And then you need to have a commitment from ownership that you're going to invest. Because guys like Pedro, for him to leave Boston, A, it's, I don't, you know, they tell you it's, it's going to be about the contract because most of the times it is about the contract. And in the end, I had to convince him. When I flew to uh, Dominican, spent Thanksgiving with him. I had history with him. I had history with his wife and his group. Uh, and, and really convinced them that, listen, we this is the plan. This is what we're doing. We're going to get you, but we're going to get other people. And I promise you that. And really, you know, you've been there when you have to, a player look at you straight in the eye. And you promise him and you tell him, we will get other pieces. Okay? And that's what it was. And then, of course, it was then the, the, the extension because it was a four-year deal. You know, where most people felt, look, there was always injury questions with Pedro. There was always a tear or something medically that was questionable. And, you know, we knew that we were going to get, we probably were not going to get four years. But if we got two and a half to three years, we were good. But the impact that he did in the city, the impact that he did to the brand, the impact that he was the ability for us to bring other guys in, and we're seeing it right now in the NBA, no different than it was with Kyrie recruiting the rent, you know, is bringing in a guy to bring other guys. And that was the model. We put it together, and it worked. It worked. We won a lot of games. We filled the stadium. I mean, sta you know, we, we, we went drawing over 3.5 a one year, 4 million people. Uh, we got close to winning every year, but we couldn't, get, we couldn't win the World Series. We made some big acquisitions as well. I mean, a lot of, a lot of key moves there. A lot of key moves to add to those teams. Uh, and one of my favorites, of course, giant Moises Alou, but also Carlos Beltran, Billy Wagner, and some others. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you were trying to build Delgado. something there. Yeah, Delgado, yeah. Delgado, Delgado that's yeah. right. And we put a recruitment plan in place. We put a recruitment plan in place um, where we would kind of have the uh, New York media, New York stars, like different guys like uh, Chris Rock and other guys, or Mark Anthony, you know, a video telling the guys, hey, come on down, come to New York, and we would get politicians. We would kind of make it like, I love New York type of video, <laughs> and we would send that to the players. And then we also had great staff around us. Like I tell you, Jim was part of that. You know, we ended up, you know, we had like, um, we had, I thought one of our superstars was Lenore Cologne. Lenore was my assistant, and she, we created really, I think, with, you know, what was called a, a, uh, a department that it was called a, a player a player service department, and I don't, where we would make sure, like with Billy, let's say Billy, I would make sure that Billy, you know, we wanted not only to let them know that this is not only a baseball decision, this is a family decision, and that's just the way our the culture that we built there from our ownership. Our ownership believed in a family environment. That's what Fred um, wanted from us. So we created an environment that is not only going to be baseball, but we're going to do everything we can internally. You know, we had like, you know, and so for those of you close to the Mets, uh, it's a young lady by the name of Teresa, her mom, you know, that it's, it was, it's a, it's a environment, it's a culture, because a lot of people don't want to go to New York, you know, and let's be honest, you know, coming to New York is t could be tough. So it was just creating an, an culture and environment that was player friendly and convincing guys to come. Like, you know, you say to yourself, like Billy Wagner, well, you know, I, Billy's from the, some, in Virginia. Virginia. I, I don't know the name of the town, but to convince Billy to come to New York and then you have this diverse group of guys, you know, whether Jose Reyes and Delgado and of course Beltran, who we you know, we ended up paying 118. It was, that was all, but it came, started off with a plan was from Pedro, getting Pedro on board. What about with Bel, uh, with Beltran and then remember, I remember we were pursuing Delgado that year too. And Delgado, we missed out on him at the Marlins, but then, then you stayed on him and you traded for him. Do you feel like uh, those two pieces were the kind of the, the, the impetus for the, the, I mean, obviously David Wright and Reyes came into their own, but, but those two guys, were they the, the, the kind of glue, would you say, to, to that 06 team? 
Well, what, what you, what's your feeling on that? Yeah, well, I, I think it's fair to say that David's a big part of that. I think it's fair to say, you know, David was young, but he was a big part. And what happened was it allowed David and Jose to be young and play the game and not be the go-to guys, okay, offensively, you know? So there's no doubt that, you know, and some veterans, you know, it helps to have some veterans in the team. You know, we ended up getting like Julio Franco, just veteran guys that were able to, it was a blend of guys. But the key, the, 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 the core group of guys, there's no doubt, it was Jose, I mean, David, uh, and Beltran and Delgado, you know, those were the guys. I mean, Jim, I, I still believe if we would have gotten, if we would have convinced Delgado to come on board in 2005, I think we would have won. We could have gotten to the World Series, gotten to the playoff. Fortunately, we missed out on him. He ended up going to, to the Marlins, and then we still got him because we felt that impact that, but boy, we would have had him. And then, and even we had Cameron, you know, that year. So, you know, it was, but there's no doubt, you know, when you recruit those kind of, Delgado was a great player and Belchon was a great player. And then you have the young energy that Jose and David brought to the, to the ballpark every day. Um, and then one guy, Jim, that I made a trade with you. It, yeah. I think it John was a May. trade or I think you had a deal with him. I don't know what to have. But one of the key guys for us was Andy Oh, Chavez. Andy, yes. I, mean, I love You got to tell this Chavez. story. This, this is a good story because now, so I go to Baltimore. I'm competing with Omar for players. And we, we you know, there's always going to be the, okay, we like similar players. I'm trying to convince Andy Chavez to come. I have a center field spot. And every day, what I think is an everyday center spot, but we're not going to be very good. And Omar turns his charm on and, t and basically convinces him to sign with the Mets. And then he makes that unbelievable catch. Yes. In, yes. in the, uh, in the NLCS, he robs, I don't know if it was Yachty or somebody goes over the fence, grabs it, doubles yes. the guy off first base. That's one of the best catches I've ever seen in a postseason game. And I was thinking about that, like, Mo, he could have been doing that in front of like, 10,000 fans in Baltimore. Instead, he's doing it in 45,000 and 50,000 at Chase Stadium. <laughs> yeah. And, Bobby, you know that that goes back to history because, remember, we signed at the match. We signed Andy, you know. I had history. We, he got Rule 5. I think uh, Kansas City yeah. Rule 5, you know. Um, and then I, I – what happened? I think the Mets – Steve claimed them again. And then I claimed them from Steve. Steve got mad right. at me <laughs> in Montreal. <laughs> In Montreal, right? You know, uh, so that's – and also I remember made a trade with you, Jim. I think we got John Main. Remember, John Main was a big yeah. part of that 2016. Yes, he was. I think he, we got John Omar Main. Omar traded me you Chris been Benson and Chris's wife, Anna, in, in, her, in her Santa Claus suit. Um, and, and, we, and, and you got John Main. And our guy said, no, nah, John Main, yeah, he's like a – he's okay. He, you know, he'll be – a solid middle reliever, fifth starter. He ends up being like the number three starter for the Mets. You know what? And, Duke, remember at that time we had a, a pitching coach. Um, we had a, Rick Peterson. He was a real good pitching sure. coach. But Rick, his, his idea of, you know, it was pitching down in the zone, which now it's like you do not want to pitch down in the zone, okay? John Main at that time, his, you know, his, he had that riser that if you – like today – that's that's what everybody wants. They want the pitchers that can able to have the ability to be able to pitch up in the zone, but and with it, you know, not up in the zone, but not too up in between. Let's just say that. And John Main had that. So when he was good, he would strike out guys like crazy. But when he was bad, he you know. But he was he, he ended up doing a good job for us. He did. But uh, have you guys and, done and trades before? By the way? Have you and Bobby ever done trades? I mean, we've talked. I mean, we, Bobby, we did was this, there a I mean, trade we, that maybe almost did, or can you remember? Bobby, where, were you, where were you in 2002? You know, I was Giants. I was Giants 2002. Oh, I, uh, I was trade. Giants since 19, 19, 1994. What was 2002? What, did, what trade was that? Well, it was Sabian, okay? I remember. But in 2003, I think it was. 2003, uh, I traded. I got Levon Hernandez after your 2002 World Series. Remember? That's right. That's LeVon, right. For some reason, they did not want him. Something. That's right. I mean, Brian, gave me, Brian paid up in Montreal. I couldn't take out nobody, so I ended up getting Le Levo, and I had it back to having history with players. I had history with Levo. I saw Levo's first game out of Cuba in in, uh, in Mexico, you know, and I had history with the family and all that. And at that time. 
Bobby, uh, I, you were there, Bobby, but they, something happened in the World Playoffs, and there was not a good feeling there. I think he, he was he was all like $7 million, and they just wanted to get rid of him. And I ended up giving a good reliever that did a good job for you guys, uh, uh, Jim Brower. Remember Jim Brower? That's right. We, yeah, we had Jim Brower for several years. He did a great job in 03, especially. Yeah, yeah. So we, I, I was in Montreal, gave up Brower for Lebo, but I got Lebo for free. And Lebo continued, he could leave a pitch very well for us. But, you know, it was just more about what, you know, at that time there was something, it was, there was some differences of opinion between Lebo and the front office or the manager, wherever it was. That, that's why I remember. Right, right. But I do believe that at that time, a lot of the dialogue might have not been with us, me and you, uh, Bobby, but I think, you know, Tony Siegel and, and Brian had a good relationship. And yeah, that's I, right. some of the dialogue happened between Tony and, and Brian, and then we ended up closing the deal out. Yeah, that's right. I remember that deal now. I, and it was a shocker in a sense because he, he pitched game seven of the World Series the previous year. Um, and, you know, a game seven that we had hoped would never have to happen. But uh, as it turned out, the you know, Angels came back, beat us in game six, and then we had game seven, and Levon made that start. And he may not have showed up in his best, best shape. I, I don't know. I don't recall what exactly happened. But I remember the deal and, 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 you know, working. I was primarily on the minor league side at that time. And, you know, it was not a deal I would expected because he had been such an important part the year before. Yeah, and that's Lebo. You know, Lebo, so, you know, some guys – or weight-wise, they're just, you know, like, you know, Panda, Levo, certain guys, you know, you, you, you work, you work with, try to tell them, and it's just, you got to be careful. It's, they just perform in what we consider, you know, not in their best shape. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, is there, is there a um, guy that you, that you, or a trade that you thought was done and, and, you know, either was this close and it went another way, or you thought, you know, like we were talking about this last night, uh, uh, Bobby had a, a had a trade. He, they thought they were getting Cole Hamels at one point. They didn't end up getting him. Was there is there anyone that stands out to you that, man, for whatever reason it fell through and you weren't able to do it, or maybe it's a trade that you feel like doesn't get enough credit for the way it turned out? Because there's always you always did a great job of those below the radar trades. I'm curious that either on either side stand out to you. So yeah, so the question is again. Um, it's more a trade that, that kind trade of trade either fell through that you thought you had, you know, you're like, man, um, I wish we had gotten him. Like you mentioned Delgado, you wish you right. signed him. Obviously, that was important. Is there something like yeah. that, or or was there a below the radar like an, another Andy Chavez type of signing? Yeah, that's a good question, Duke. You know, uh, because there's so many trades that we've done over the years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about Gary you, Sheffield? Adding Sheffield? Yeah, yeah, funny one. Go ahead. Give yeah, I'll tell you a funny one, and this is. Uh, so me and Jay, me and uh, me and KT, okay, where, you know, where we're in the winter meetings. I think we're in New Orleans, and me and KT were very close friends. You know, we're pretty, you know, good. And if you know KT, you know, the game is a little different. But you go to the winter meeting in those days, and you had a couple of glasses <laughs> of wine. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I love it. So uh, you know, me and KT would make a trade together, and we're like. And then we're going back and forth, and we're trying to be macho and this and that. And, you know, I'll give you this guy, I'll give you that guy. Well, anyway, it was late into the night. I like That's all I can tell you, okay? Yeah. yeah. And the next day was the Rule 5 that draft. Remember the, that, that Rule 5 draft? Yeah. That's at the end of the winter meetings, and the Rule 5 draft was at 9. And we, we I went to bed probably like about, I don't know, might have been 4 or 5 in the morning. And I'm kind of, I wake up, and I'm still like, and I say to Tony C, I say, T. I know me and me and KT were just, you know, back and forth. And to be honest with you, I, I know we made a trade, but I don't remember who it was. <laughs> right. <laughs> so KT, he got Freddie Oman. You know, we all love Freddie, you know. And he tells he tells Freddie the next morning, hey, me and Oman were hanging out late last night. And, um, you know, uh, I know we made a trade, but. I don't know the details of the trade or, or who it was. <laughs> Neither so, one of you remember the details. So we kind of like we knew he would make a trade, but it was because it was because we were friends and we were back and forth and this and that. We just didn't know details of the trade, kind of small details of the trade. So we ended up, you know, he doing that rule five draft. You know, it's a big room. Yes. It's a big room there. Okay. So I made sure I stayed on the east side. He made sure he stayed on the west side <laughs> of the room. 
we ended up in the end we ended up saying that he came back to me and you will love this bobby because uh, uh, God, uh rest in peace kt because we love you he oh, came yeah. back to me and he said uh and that guy we traded was pete, pete bergeron remember saying pete Peter bergeron I, and you know and he said to me and you will love this hey man oh he said tell oh that he didn't even tell me i think he's afraid he tell me he said tell <laughs> oh that um that uh, uh, what's the manager's name there at that time? He had uh, uh, that you had, uh, Bobby. Um, Bochy. Well, he well, said yeah, that Bochy likes to play there too much, and Bochy, Bochy said Bochy killed the trade. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trade that never went through. That you that, that was a that, trade okay. that never went through. But as far as players and rec, you know, we, you know like a, something, you know, we were close to. I'm trying to think. Nah, not really. I don't remember one where we said, hey, you know, we got a deal done or we don't have yeah. a deal done. Um, I will tell you one tray that was a classic tray, and that was one that I think uh, if I had to think of one that made a difference in winning the World Series, and this is a, a three-way tray, and if you talk to Terry Ryan about this, he'll tell you still. So when Orlando Cabrera went from Montreal to Boston, that was, I believe, a four-way trade. It was, yeah. It was uh, Henry, 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 Minnesota, to, um, Expos, and Boston. Right. And right. Jimmy Henry was putting the whole thing together because I, I rich, I wasn't even going to trade Orlando. You know, Jimmy put the whole thing together. Uh, I forgot who we ended up with. I think we ended up with an outfielder and maybe a pitcher and. All I know is that when it was all said and done, uh, Minnesota would, thought they were going to get a pitcher by the name of Jones, and they did not get him. Um, but those were, you know, those late, and that happened, I think at that time, the trading deadline was at 4 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. It still might be 4 o'clock. And it happened, and it was, it was a, I don't know, I asked Terry Ryan about that, but he ended up get thought he was going to get a player, didn't get a player. Now you go get Orlando Cabrera. Orlando Cabrera goes to Boston, and a lot of people feel that if they don't get Orlando Cabrera, they don't win their World Series. Yeah, mm -hmm. they that's true. right. That's true. right. All right, we have one more, Owen, and then we'll let you go. We always appreciate it. Uh, one story, if you want to go back to that, maybe stands out to either two thousand because you never got the World Series ring, right? So two thousand, we were close. Two thousand six, really close. What stands out about either one of those years? Um, is it the Timo not running the ball out? Does that change you know, the way things happen in that World Series? Is it the, you know, what, what is it the, you know, Wainwright, you know, catches Beltron swinging it? Like, what stands out about either of those two moments for you? Oh, no doubt. Know? I mean, people talk about the Timo, and I get that, and it was a great play by Jeter. But to me, Jim, we were sitting there right next to the dugout, right next to the yeah. Yeah. Mets dugout at Yankee Stadium. To me, what stands out about that, it was the Paul O'Neill at bat, without a doubt, okay? Because if Benitez, could, he cannot close out Paul O'Neill, and he closes out Paul O'Neill, we win that game. It was that simple. The game, it wasn't, it wasn't a team O, because that, that happened early in the game. I think the Paul O'Neill at bat, if you go back and look at it, I think Paul yeah. fouled off like about six to seven pitches. And I think that would have been out too, if I'm not mistaken, Pretty sure. okay? Yeah. And that that's the game. That was the game for me. That was the game without a doubt. Now, can we – do we have enough to beat them? You know what? I think – did we win game two? No, we didn't – we did not win game two. We did two, not did win we? game two, but we, we were winning – should have won game one. I think we won game three. Yes. So, yeah, very exactly. easily we could have been up two games to one in that 2000 World Series. You know what? Instead, and we were down And the other thing that I feel one. about that, about that, I think game two was the one – where Piazza gets jammed and Clemens throws the bat. And I'm looking at it and saying to myself, please, somebody, yeah. you know, like, if you become aggressive with Clemens, I mean, it's a possibility he might, he might be out of the game. Right. You know? Right. We don't know. In it, the it same sense, that moment. you don't want Piazza getting thrown out of the game because he was our best no. offensive player. No. So exactly. it would have been right. nice no. Somebody Piazza, go after but, but Clemens. Clemens was the aggressor. Clemens was the aggressor in that situation. Yeah. That's right. So I'm saying, say, how come one of those 
the 28th, the 29th, or, you know, because you have some guys that were, you, you have more than 25 guys on the bench. I think you carried some, whatever. What are those bench guys? <laughs> so I do remember, it was the, without a doubt, the O'Neal at bat. That was, to me, that was the game. That was the game. You know, Benitez, he just keeps on following him off, following him off, following him off. He closes out O'Neal. O'Neal walks, I think, and and then extends the inning, and then they they, they come back. To me, that was the thing. Yeah. 2006, you know, oh God, I, I just, I, I think of, um, look, I think when I when I think of the, uh, the 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 Eddie play, the Chavez play, you know, you, you guys have been there, and you're saying to yourself, you know, the guys are looking at us today. We're going to win this game. Yeah. That's how we felt. At least I felt like when he made that play. I'm saying, God, the gods are looking at us. We're gonna win. We're gonna win this game. It didn't turn out to be that way. Look, the Wainwright, um, those were unhittable pitches, without a doubt. And there was not much you can do about that. Um, I, I think that there was, you know, to me, it was just. I thought that the, the Andy place, you know, that kind of, kind of almost. And then I also remember, and Jim, you will remember this. The, the place was rocking. And Shea Stadium in those days, when something like that happened, it used to kind of – it kind of used to shake a little bit, you know? Yeah. Because the people and, – and I'm saying to myself, my God, I said, this place – listen, you know, and I was thinking if one of those guys hits a home run here in the night, this place may collapse. I don't even know. With this. There was always a, an uneasy feeling in Shea Stadium. Like, because yeah. they used to sway a little, like, whoa, time out, you know? It would move. But, uh, yeah, it was. That listen, was, that scary. was I love the Mets fans. I like you said, as a kid, as a guy that grew up in New York, uh, Mets fans are great fans, and we had a good run there. We just could not pull up, could not win the World Series, and right. and the, the Subway Series. Wow, that was awesome. That was really, yeah. really awesome. That Incredible. Was that was fun. Oh, we appreciate it. We could go on and on. I really appreciate the time. This was fun. Yeah, thank you, Omar. Um, and, and we'll be talking to you. I'm, I know because uh, you know. Ho hopefully. Um, We'll do this again sometime because we didn't even get into the Johan Santana acquisition, the no hitter oh, that he threw. Well, like all let's of do that. it again. Let's we'll do, it, do again. it again. We'll do it we'll again, do it some again some other time. And there's a lot of, you know, it's, but it's fun. It's but it's great to be part of this game. And you know, you talked about um, Bobby about try, you know, we're using the word gentleman. You know, the, I, the thing about this game is just getting to know the people and having a relationship and friendship and. Um, it's still, you know, it's a different game as far as the way this game is being, you know, at least, uh, um, how things are being done, attacked and performed. Uh, but the people of the game are just great people and, uh, and it's a lot of fun. And, you know, I've had, you know, to be able to talk about, you know, like I said, Kevin Towers, uh, uh, rest in peace and all the, you know, friends that we've acquired, Brian Cashman's of the world and all those. It's uh, no a lot of great men. And you worked for a great one and, and Brian Saban. That, that, that was yes, a great I did. One. You and Tony Siegel, Tony Siegel and Brian are the ones who originally hired me from the commissioner's office. So Tony and I go way back as well. So uh, back in 1994, it took me from uh, Roy Krasick oh. and Jimmy Lee Solomon in the commissioner's office over to the Giants. So oh, great people. I will say this. You asked about a question of, one, of a trade that didn't happen that should have happened, and you brought up Tony Siegel, Siegel. And I'll tell you what it was, and we'll finish it off. Yeah. We're in the GM meetings. And remember, everybody's, you know, we're M's and, you know, you're, you're, you're seated by uh, the first letter of your team. I was always seated next to, I believe, Minnesota, Montreal, and all that. And Terry Ryan comes up to me, whispers in my, and tells me, because he's a, hey, oh, listen, I, I'm not going to tender. I'm not going to tender. My manager does not like David Ortiz. I'm not going to tender him. Okay? Take him. You know what? Just take – and I like David Ortiz from Winterball. He said, I'll give him to you. If you sign him, just give me something. You know what I'm saying? And at that time, you know, and, you know, first of all, financially, I don't know if I can do it, you know, because of the way what, the way we were set up. And he, he was going to be arbitration eligible, you know. Um, you know, he wasn't going to offer him arbitration. So, you know, remember how it was and somebody's behind you. You know, you, your assistant was always behind you. And I'm like, ooh, and I like David Ortiz, you know, and I like David Ortiz. And I look, and I go to Tony. I say, hey, Tony, hey, we got a chance to get David Ortiz, you know. Um, I got to give him somebody. You know, what do you think? And we love Tony. But, you know, Tony's Mr. No. Oh, he starts off with no. For everything is no first, you know. 
I said, oh, no, we got to have to do a, a, a roster move. And you know him and his roster. That's so all he loved. I didn't follow up on it between me and you. And then the, but you know, the best thing that ever happened to David Ortiz was not go to Montreal. He could use that, that big wall in left field. That was That's one right. of those that, now don't get me wrong, I possibly, you know, from an arbitration standpoint, I probably maybe not signed him because we couldn't add dollars when I was in Montreal. But that was one that, wow. and that was my, wow. my boy, uh, Tony Siegel. Tony. Tony. That's a good one. That's a good one. All right, we're going to end on that. Oh, thanks again for the time. We'll do it again sometime. Really appreciate it. All right, guys. It. All the best. Take care.